In this section, we're going to continue talking about optimization problems, but we're going to add the idea of having a constraint in these problems, which is going to change the process a little bit. So we're still going to try to find to we're going to still try to find the min or the max of a function. That is the idea of optimizing a function. But again, we're going to have some constraint in the problem, something that's preventing all x, y values to be used. In order to go over this section, what we're going to do is we're going to go over the example in the book in depth. We're going to try to say things different than what the book does, but still go over that example. Uh, note that I usually don't like to just follow the book, but in this case, I think it does a good job. And I think it's the best way to sort of understand why we're doing the things we're doing. In the next video, we'll go over some other practice problems to see um, some other examples being done. All right, so let's set up this example. We have a function of two variables, x to the two thirds times y to the one third. And this is gonna represent production of a company. Somehow production is being measured in some unit and that production depends on two different raw materials. That's gonna be represented by x and y. So x is gonna represent the amount of the first raw material, y is gonna represent the amount of the second raw material. And these two raw materials each cost $100 per unit. The company has a budget that allows for 378,000 to be spent on these raw materials. So there's this budget that's in place, which is a very real life kind of thing to do. We don't have infinite money to spend on the raw materials. We have a certain amount of money that's allocated to spend on these two raw materials. They each cost $100 per unit. And we want to maximize the production, keeping to this budget constraint. So we want to see how much of X should we buy and how much of Y should we buy to maximize our production with the budget that we have. So we're gonna talk about two different kind of functions or equations in these problems, the objective function and the constraint equation. So the objective function is the function we are trying to maximize or minimize. the thing we're trying to optimize, same thing. And in this case, that is going to be the function f of x, y equal to x to the two thirds, y to the one third. And this is representing production here. The constraint equation has to do with the budget in this problem. It's what's only allowing for certain x, y values to be used. So we can't have x and y both be really, really big numbers because it wouldn't allow in that budget. Or we can't have x and y be negative numbers so that doesn't make sense in the problem. So our constraint equation says that we have 378,000 to spend on these raw materials. I'm gonna put that over here right now, 378,000. That is the cost and it's the cost of spending $100 per unit of X plus $100 per unit of Y. All right, we could think about this if this doesn't make sense. You know, say that you buy, you know, five units of X and five units of Y. You can multiply each of those by 100, add them together, and that's how much you've spent total. So this is somehow representing the cost total of just these two raw materials being bought. And what we're gonna do in these problems is we're gonna call this function g of x, y, this 100x plus 100y, and we're going to have the constraint equation that g of x, y is equal to $378,000. And we'll talk about why we're setting it up like this um, later on when we talk about the actual process we're going to go through. But we have this one equation, 100x plus 100y equals 378,000, and we're going to represent this with this function g of xy. So we have two functions, two equations that we're kind of looking at, the objective function and the constraint equation. So let's think about this constraint equation. Let's try to make sense of it a little bit more. So let's ask a couple of questions that don't have to do with maximizing so much, just thinking about the problem. 
if the company purchase, purchases 1,000 units of X, how many units of Y should be purchased in order to maximize production? And then ask, what is the production in this case? So if we have 1,000 units of X, if we wanna maximize production, then we should spend all of the money that we have. So in this case, we can use our function 100 times X, which is now 1,000, plus 100Y is equal to 378,000. If you wanna maximize production, you need to spend all of the money that you have. We're not trying to maximize profit necessarily, just maximizing production. So solving for this equation, we have 100,000 plus 100Y equals 378,000. Subtract the 100,000 and we have 100Y equals 278,000. So Y is going to be 2,780. So in this case, we should purchase 2,780 units of Y in order to get to that $378,000 threshold. And the production here would be plugging this into F. So we're looking at F of 1,000, 2,780, which would be 1,000 to the one third, 2,780 to the two thirds. I'm sorry, uh, that's backwards. Should be 1,000 to the two thirds, 2,780 to one third, X to the two thirds, Y to the one third. And if we plug this into a calculator, we get the value of about 1406.1. Uh, whatever production is being measured in 1406.1. So let's do another example, thinking about maybe not how much we uh, purchase of X or Y, but it's how much money is spent in X and Y. So let's say that we spend 200,000 on X. So how much should be spent on Y in order to maximize production? Well, there's $378,000 total. So we should spend 178,000 on Y. And what that really means is that 100X is equal to 200,000. So X is equal to 2,000. And 100Y is equal to 178,000. That's Y equals to 1780. And again, to maximize production, we're saying that we have to equal 378,000, so there's no money left over. And the production here would be plugging those two values in to the function Two thousand to the one third, two thirds, seventeen eighty to the one third, which gives us a value of about nineteen twenty three point eight. So then the question is what value of X and what value of Y is going to maximize this function? We found that if we plug in X equals 1000 and Y equals uh, 2780, we get a production of 1406. And we found a bigger production by doing X equals 2000, Y equals 1780. So again, the question is, how much should it be to maximize this production? And this little note at the bottom just says that, again, if you're gonna have a, a constraint that you need to uh, match that constraint, in order to maximize or minimize the thing that we're talking about. And this is always gonna be the case in these problems. So if you're thinking about budget, the actual constraint that we have is 100X plus 100Y is less than or equal to 378,000. If you have a budget, you don't necessarily need to match that number in the budget. You can come in underneath it. But in these problems, if you wanna maximize or minimize, you have to 
match that budget that you're given. You have to use all of the money that you possibly can. All right, so we've set up this problem. Now let's look at this thing graphically to see if we can get some ideas of what's going on. So what we have here is we're gonna be looking at contours of our objective function, F, and we're gonna be looking at the curve of our constraint equation. We have two functions here, uh, F and G. So note that this is G of X, Y equals 378,000. And then we have our uh, production contours as well. So note that what we really have here drawn are four different contours of functions. We have the contour of G, our constraint uh, curve, and then we have three contours of F. And we're kind of putting them all together and we're looking at a difference between them. Um, it's okay that the contour of G crosses the contours of F because it's a different function, but we're gonna see the relationship between them to answer some questions. Uh, note that this budget constraint 100X plus 100Y equals 378,000 is just a line. You could write it as Y equals 3780 minus X, if you kind of solve for Y there. It has a slope of negative one, it has a y-intercept of 3780. So if you want, you can kind of put these values here as well. There's our line. And we're gonna show that this point here, this point P, is going to be where the maximum production is gonna take place. So we're gonna use these ideas of the contours to build our uh, process. All right, so let's look at this in more detail on the next page. So same picture there, and we say that the maximum point is gonna be at that point P. And what's gonna happen is that's gonna be when the constraint curve, that contour of G is going to be tangent to a contour of F. So the constraint curve is the contour of G. And that's going to be tangent to a contour, we should say, of F. When the black line is going to be tangent to one of the blue lines. And although it's not the case in this problem, what will occur in some problems is that if you draw a contour diagram, you may not have drawn the correct contour to actually get that tangential point. Right, there's an infinite amount of contours you could draw, you usually pick nice values. That doesn't necessarily mean that's going to be um, one of the contours in your graph. All right, uh, the reasoning behind this um, has to do, uh, so let's just think about this reasoning, think about this, this picture. And I think the best way to do it is to draw a little graph of what's happening to function values along this budget constraint. So here we go, let's draw a little diagram. Here is our budget constraint. Uh, we'll call it our budget constraint curve. And we're gonna label some points. So for instance, we know that we're gonna start at the point Uh, X equals zero, Y equals 3,780. And we're gonna end at the point 3,780, zero. So we are going kind of along this line in that direction on the curve. Just kind of following that line and seeing what happens to the function, the uh, function values on that curve. So our Y axis kind of here, is going to be our F values. Uh, we know that it can be 2,000, 1,000, or less. All right, so let's think about some of these values. We know that um, uh, if we have 
x or y being 0, we actually have a function value of 0. You can check that for yourself with the function itself. And then we have a couple of different points. So we know that at this point right here and close to that point right there, that's where the black line is going to intersect the curve f equals 1,000. So that's going to represent the function value of 1,000. So I'm just going to kind of estimate where that is. All right, one is really, really close to the other guy, the, begin, the ending point, I should say. And then we have the special point of P here. Or that's going to intersect the curve f equals 2,000. And that's all the function values that we know, except that we know that it's, nothing's going to be greater than 2,000 because greater than 2,000 in the diagram is going to correspond to everything to the right of that contour. All right, that's everything greater than 2,000 in our graph. Everything to the left is going to be less than that. And this is why we're looking for the tangential point, the point that it hits that contour once, because that's going to tell us that it is maximizing that function. If we think about this curve real quick, we kind of put the pieces together. Uh, it's going to look something like this. And we can see that this budget is going to be maximized, there's be some kind of maximum at that special point where we have the tangential contour. All right, uh, that's just trying to understand why this works. When it all is said and done, we just need to know that it is the point that the tangential contour happens. So we have the contour of G is tangent to a contour of F. And note that we have two a contour of f, not to one contour, but just uh, not one specific contour, but to any contour, it's tangent, and that's the specific contour. Note that this contour that we were tangent to, that's going to be our max production. So without even doing the actual process we're going to uh, look at in the next page, we can see that our max production is going to be 2,000 units. We just need to kind of show that algebraically now. All right, so let's look at our process. This process we're going to call Lagrange multipliers. All right, and here's the idea. Because the contour and the constraint curve must be tangent to each other, we have that in some capacity, the derivatives of those functions must be parallel. And if things are parallel, we know that they're constant multiples of each other. And we're going to call this constant multiple lambda. It is some factor that is going to tell us the difference between those parallel derivatives. Now, I want to make very clear about what we say derivatives in some capacity is not derivatives how we're necessarily thinking about them. This idea is actually attributed to normal vectors of these curves. This is something that you might learn in a Calculus 3 course. And it's the normal vectors of the curve that are parallel. But in order to find the normal vectors, you are using the derivatives in a huge way. So it is something about the derivatives. We know that tangents have to do something with derivatives. And we're saying something about the derivatives being parallel. And parallel means that they, the derivatives are constant multiples of each other. So that's the idea in a broad sense. We're not going to talk about it much more than that. Uh, in fact, that's more in-depth than the book will go into it. Um, we're now just going to focus on the actual process. But note that this comes from the idea of normal vectors and the fact that derivatives are parallel in some way. All right, so here's the process of Lagrange multipliers. If you want to optimize some function, our objective function f, subject to a constraint g of x, y equals c, that's some constraint equation, we are going to solve the system of three equations, these three equations right here. The first equation is the partial with respect to x of f is equal to the constant multiple lambda times the partial with respect to g of x. 
Then we do the exact same thing with y. So we have the two partials, x and y. We're going to set them equal to each other with a constant multiple lambda. And then our third equation is just the original constraint equation, g equals c. And this is a system of three equations, and we have three unknowns. Uh, those being x, y, and then also this unknown, whatever lambda is. In a lot of problems, we're not going to care about what lambda is, but we are going to show um, in this video what lambda does represent and how it can be useful as well. So three equations and three unknowns should allow us to find x, y, and lambda in all of these problems. So note that the process is if there's a point x, y that satisfies this system, it will optimize f under the constraint of g. And this will give us the point that we are maximizing or minimizing the function. Uh, and then also know that lambda is called the Lagrange multiplier. Uh, if you've never seen lambda before, this is the Greek letter lambda, lowercase lambda, uh, often written as we've written right there. Okay, uh, note that a capital lambda will look like that, but we're using lowercase lambda here. Okay, so let's look at our process. Let's do our example right here. We want to maximize the function x to the two-thirds, y to the one-third, subject to the constraint g of xy equals 100x plus 100y equals 378,000. And note that we've added two other details here that's just in terms of the problem. Uh, we can't have X and Y be negative. Doesn't make sense in this problem. We are only buying materials, not selling materials. And we're trying to maximize production, not anything like profit. All right, so let's do this. We have our functions. We need to set up our three equations and three unknowns. So I need to find the partial derivatives of F and G with respect to X and with respect to Y. So let's do that first. So the partial of f with respect to x, we know that y to the one-third is a constant in terms of x, so it's just going to come along for the ride. So basically we're looking at just the derivative of x to the two-thirds, which will be two-thirds x to the negative one-third as we subtract one from that exponent, and then times y to the one-third. The partial with respect to y is we're going to have x to the two-thirds be our constant. That's going to come along for the ride. And we're going to look at the derivative of y to the one-third, which will be one-third y to the negative two-thirds, decrease the power by one. And then we have the x to the two-thirds coming along for the ride. All right, then we're going to find the partials of g with respect to x and y. So we have g sub x. Here, uh, note that the 378,000 is not what we're looking at. We're looking at just g of x, y. And we're saying that the 100y is a constant. So this is just going to be the derivative of 100x, which is 100. And g of y g sub y will be similar as 100x is our constant. Our derivative will be the derivative of 100y, which is 100. All right, so we found our partial derivatives. Now we need to set up our equations. Our first equation is the partial with respect to x of f is going to be equal to lambda times the partial of g with respect to x. So note this is f of x is equal to lambda g sub x. Then we do the same thing with the y's. One third x to the two thirds, y to the negative two thirds equals lambda times 100. Again, that's our f sub y equals lambda g sub y. 
And then our third equation is just the constraint equation that we're given in the problem. That is 100x plus 100y equals 378,000. So this is our g of x, y equals c. All right, three equations and three unknowns is going to allow us to find the um, three unknowns. It's going to be enough information to find this. Uh, there's going to be lots of different ways that you could go about this, but let's go over the easiest way for this problem. And note that in the next video, we'll look at different kind of um, systems and different ways that we're going to do this. So the easiest way to do this is to eliminate one of the variables and just look at just x and y. And we'll look at those first two equations and note that since they're both equal to lambda times 100, we can set the other parts equal to each other. So we can write this as 2 thirds x to the negative 1 third y to the 1 third equals 1 third x to the 2 thirds y to the negative 2 thirds. And that's because they're both equal to lambda 100, which means that they should be equal to each other. Now, if you want to solve x and y in this equation, if you want to do something here, a nice thing we could do is maybe we could multiply by, or actually maybe better to even just kind of rewrite this as 2 thirds y to the 1 third over x to the 1 third. That's what a negative exponent is really telling us is that we have a power in the denominator is going to be equal to one third x to the two thirds y to the two thirds and if we do a kind of cross multiplication kind of thing if we multiply both sides by x to the one third uh, that'll and and let's do the same thing uh, y to the two thirds at the same time x to the one third is going to cancel out, y to the two thirds is going to cancel out. And we will be left with 2 thirds y to the two thirds times y to the one third equals one third x to the two thirds x to the one third which is just the same thing as 2 thirds y equals 1 third x. If you multiply by 3 on both sides, you get 2y equals x. All right. So that's something we just kind of eliminated a whole bunch of stuff. And now we know that 2y is equal to x. We can use our third equation to solve for x and y now. So we're going to plug that 2y equals x into our third equation. So how can we do that? We can do a little uh, substitution. We know that 100 times x plus 100y is equal to 378,000. But instead of writing x, I can write 2y. This will give us 200y plus 100y, which is 300y is equal to 378,000. And when we take 378,000 divided by 300, we get y is equal to 1260. And then, so that is one of our values that we're looking for. Then to find x, we can just do that 2y is equal to x. So 2 times 1260 will be equal to x, that means x is equal to 2520. All right, so there are the points that we're going to maximize.
And the actual maximization, maximization of the function, actual optimization of the function is plugging those values into F. So our maximum is going to be F of 25, 20, 12, 60, just like we did on the second page here, which will be 25, 20 to the 2 thirds power, 12, 60 to the 1 third power. And if you plug that into a calculator, you'll get that the maximum is 2,000, which we said we should get using the graph as well. And note that this was bigger than the two values that we kind of played around with earlier. This is our maximum. All right, one more thing here and then we'll be done with this video. Uh, let's talk about what this Lagrange multiplier lambda actually is, um, as it is a special kind of value. All right, so in our example, we had x equals 2520, y equals 1260. Plugging these into either of the first two equations in the Lagrange multiplier process, we'll get 2 thirds, 25, 20 equal, uh, to the negative 1 third. So this is the equation, I should say, F sub X equals lambda G sub X. If we're plugging in those values, we can solve for lambda. And if we plug that in, we can get that lambda is about 0 0.0053. Nothing special just as itself, but let's talk about what this really means. All right, so in a real life kind of example, this budget constraint of 378,000 um, could be flexible, right? You might increase the budget from year to year. You might change it um, with different things happening. So let's say that the company's budget increased to 379,000 instead of 378,000. This changes the problem completely, right? We have to redo everything. All the values will be different. And if we did all of that work, we would get that X is equal to 2527 and Y equals 1263. And now the maximum value isn't 2000, but 2005.4. It makes sense that the production is going to increase because we have more money to spend, $1,000 more. So looking at these values, we have that if we increase the budget by $1,000, the production increased by 5.4, about 5.4. And note that 5.4 is about 1,000 times our value of lambda. And in general, that's what lambda is gonna represent an increase in the constraint, or in this case, the budget by one unit, by $1, will increase the production by lambda units. This lambda tells us about how much we're going to increase or decrease our function based on our constraint going up or down. So here, lambda is gonna be delta F over delta G. That is the change in the optimum value of F over the change in G. Lambda is telling us something about the derivative of the change in the constraint give over the change in the optimum value or uh, vice versa. All right, in the next video, we'll look at some more examples to get more comfortable with Lagrange multipliers and this idea of maximizing or minimizing with a constraint.